Welcome to our next live session on Free From and Elegy Virtual Show. Our next presenter on the Free From and Allergy Virtual Show is Brooke Stratton. Brooke is a Victorian and an Olympian, and she is the current Australian record holder in long jump, and she is a 2018 Commonwealth Games silver medalist. Brooke was diagnosed with celiac disease in 2013, and we're absolutely thrilled to have her here today. Welcome, Brooke. Hi, Mari. Thanks for having me. Hi, Mari. Oh, it's great to have you. So let's jump right into it, Brooke. How did you find out that you were celiac and what were your symptoms? So it actually took almost a year and a half to get the diagnosis that I had celiac disease. Um, basically, in 2011, uh, I started developing the symptoms that progressively got worse and worse uh, all through 2012. And unfortunately, uh, it had been a goal of mine to get to the 2012 London Olympics. And due to feeling so unwell all through that year, I actually missed those Olympic Games uh, and found that throughout that year, my symptoms were getting worse and worse. Um, I was back and forth with my mum at the local GP, just trying to put a finger on what was actually going on with my body and basically was having blood tests after blood tests and all that would really show up was, you know, being, you know, having vitamin and mineral deficiencies such as low iron, uh, low vitamin D, low B12. And basically I was told that I was fine. Uh, I just needed to take some iron tablets and some vitamin D and B12 tablets and I'd be fine. Um, but this definitely didn't help. And almost, yeah, as I said, a year and a half later, I started getting quite severe symptoms such as stomach bloating, stomach cramps, brain fog, uh, just very irritable as well, uh, reflux. Uh, and mm. this sort of led me to the point where I needed to figure out what was going on because being an athlete, you know, you need to be healthy and you need to be getting the most out of your body uh, in training and during competitions. And I found that I wasn't able to do this. I was going down to training, I felt extremely fatigued. I was so tired every day. I could barely get out of bed and it just, it wasn't right. It wasn't me. I was also struggling to find the motivation to train because I felt so unwell. And yeah, so a year and a half later, I finally was referred on to see a gastroenterologist and I was diagnosed with celiac disease. So it was definitely, uh, a big shock. I didn't realize that something so severe was happening to my body, but at the same time, it was a massive relief because I knew that obviously, you know, I was experiencing these symptoms for a reason and I could change up my diet and be able to move forward and hopefully look towards achieving my goal of getting to the Olympics, you know, within that next few years. Wow. So we'll get back to that point where you were, your goal was to go to London and through that time you were really struggling. But can you explain the difference to our audience between celiac and gluten intolerant? Yeah, sure. So from what I gather, um, celiac disease is obviously an autoimmune disease where the body attacks the lining of the small intestine causing damage. Um, and I think the difference between celiac disease and a gluten intolerance is with those having gluten intolerance, they don't experience that internal damage that celiacs do. So obviously they would probably um, you know, experience similar symptoms to those with celiac disease. But yeah, as I said, just not uh, experiencing that internal damage and that damage to the small intestine. And so at that time when you were diagnosed, did your friends and family understand and were they accommodating or did you really have to educate them as well? I mean, it took you so long to be actually diagnosed and you were suffering a lot during that period. How did your friends and family react? 
Um, so it's funny you ask because I remember very clearly in my mind driving home from my appointment with my gastroenterologist and this was post-diagnosis and me and my mum just burst into tears in the car um, because, you know, it was more so a relief knowing why I'd been feeling yeah. so unwell. But I think also my mum was a little bit stressed about not knowing what food I could eat and I didn't have any idea either. Um, so I was very fortunate to, you know, have had my family being so supportive of me and my mum has been nothing short of amazing the whole way through since my diagnosis. Um, we both did our research and educated ourselves as much as we could to ensure that you know, we could work around this. And at that point in time, I was living at home with my family and you know, my mum was cooking some of my meals. My partner or my fiance, I should say, Nathan's mum was... Uh, cooking dinner for me some nights and she was absolutely uh, fantastic in making sure that there was always an option for me there. Um, my coach, who's also my father, has been incredible. Uh, I do a lot of travel with him and, you know, just making sure that he's putting myself first and making sure that there's food to eat around competition time that is safe. And my fiance Nathan has been amazing as well. I honestly feel like he, yeah, it, it's it's made the process so much easier for me to transition to that gluten free diet. Um, he also eats ninety five percent gluten free. I'd say um, he eats too much bread to be able to transition across to gluten free bread because he'd probably be eating a loaf a day, I reckon, and that would be very expensive. <laughs> um, and in terms of um, my friends and family, uh, they've been absolutely fantastic as well. And so understanding and you know, always making sure that they're uh, booking ahead when it comes to eating out at restaurants and cafes. Uh, and I think a lot of them, uh, you know, increase their knowledge on what celiac disease was in their own time. So I'm very grateful for the acceptance and support that all my friends and family have showed. And obviously that's a really important part of it. So do you find eating out challenging? You said your friends contact cafes or restaurants. Um, is it challenging for you or are restaurants and cafes, certainly here in Australia, right across it now and there's always multiple options for you to order? I certainly do find it challenging. Um, however, more and more restaurants and cafes are definitely more aware of what celiac disease is and will cater for the needs of a gluten-free diet these days. Uh, also, the awareness of cross-contamination is increasing. Um, so I'm finding more restaurants and cafes are conscious of using things such as separate toasters, separate oils, um, you mm -hmm. know, when frying food, as well as separate cutlery. Um, mm -hmm. In saying that I won't eat out at cafes or restaurants during the athletic season, um, except for the odd occasion maybe where I've got a period of time between competitions, just because I don't want to take any risks around uh, you know, big competitions because I know how much, you know, an accidental exposure can affect my performance and I don't think it's worth taking these risks. So you're an Olympic athlete and you've, you have this um, issue of celiac disease. If we go back to when you were first diagnosed and you were wanting to go to London, it was always your goal. How did you react to that at the time? Uh, it was a very hard pill to swallow, to be honest, because the previous year in 2011, um, I had jumped a personal best of 6 metres 60, which was the equal Australian wow. under 20 long jump record. And this distance mm. was only five centimetres off the qualifying standard for the London Olympics. So within that year period, all I needed to improve was five centimetres. Um, so... It, it's not much at all. And I guess, you know, having come, come back from Germany that year where I jumped that 
six meters 60 i knew that it was well within my sights the london london olympics and with the way that i was progressing the years prior i knew that i could do it um and if anything it was super frustrating for me because i knew that my body was capable of doing it but it wouldn't mm. allow me to because mm. basically i was fueling my body or i should say i was defueling my body um so i was eating all these foods that were just you know full of gluten thinking that i was fueling my body to compete and to train day in day mm. out and it was actually having the opposite effect. So I would get to competitions and I would just feel drained. I'd feel exhausted. I was struggling to focus. Um, and I just, I just completely, I didn't feel myself at all. So it was a frustrating year. And I think, you know, that relief of getting that diagnosis, I think saved mm. me from probably giving up the sport because, you know, I, I was struggling so much and all my, you know, my family and friends were seeing that. Um, but it definitely wasn't like me to give up. And I think if anything, it's taught me mm. to be super resilient and not let anything get in the way of me achieving my dreams. And although I didn't get to London, um, I did get to Rio. So that was amazing. Fantastic. So when, if we go back, I mean, obviously you must have been, an amazing athlete through your teenage years. What, when did you decide you wanted to be an Olympian and knew that you probably had it in you to achieve that? That's a great question. Um, so I started a little athletics when I was quite young. So I was five years of age. And when I was yeah. actually in grade one, I watched the Sydney Olympics on TV from home. And I remember watching Kathy Freeman win the gold medal for Australia. And wow. that moment was such a pivotal moment in my career yeah. because it was the moment yeah. that I realized that that's what I wanted to do when I grew older. I wanted to be an Olympian. And I remember in primary school telling everyone I wanted to be like Kathy Freeman when I grew up and I wanted to go wow. to the Olympics. And Basically, from that moment, I started taking my athletics quite seriously. I was always really competitive uh, from a young age. Mm. I have three other siblings who were all really involved in sport as well. So we'd have some awesome competitions out in our backyard when we were kids. Um, and yeah, just that competitive nature was what kept me wanting more and kept me uh, motivated. And when I was eight years of age, I broke the center record in the long jump just down at our athletics club. And the year oh, after that, I made it to the state championships. The year after that, I made it to the national championships. So things were progressing wow. really nicely. And along the way, I was breaking state records. And I think I broke a couple of Australian records as well. So I knew that I had the talent, but I didn't know how much talent I had and if I had the potential to get to that, you know, Olympic level, because I was still re like relatively young. Uh, when I was 15, I qualified for my first junior international team. Uh, so I traveled over to Germany to compete there. I also went on a couple of years later to compete at the world junior championships where I uh, placed sixth when I was bottom age and seventh when I was top age. So I was able to mix it with the best long jumpers in the world in my age group. And I knew that I just had to keep progressing from, from there. Um, and then that's when basically I jumped this under 20 Australian record and I knew that uh, it was well within my sights, this goal. And I just had to keep working hard, keep making sacrifices, making good choices, um, and I could hopefully get there. But then that's when celiac disease struck and everything kind of, or those plans of getting to London kind of went out the door because I was just struggling so much with my health. We'll talk about your plans for next Olympics in July, but before we get to that, when you have been traveling to all of these countries as an athlete, how are you dealing with um, your celiac disease? How easy is it for you to have and find the appropriate fuel you you need and in various countries? Has that been challenging for you? 
It definitely has been challenging. Um, when I first got diagnosed in 2013, I actually had a competition in Taiwan uh, about two oh. weeks after my diagnosis. So that was a real challenging time because one, I still didn't really know what food I could and couldn't eat. And two, mm. I wasn't able to read food labels because it was in symbols. So that was really challenging. I guess that's, <laughs> that's part of being a celiac. You need to be super organized. And I've found that over the years, mm. traveling, you know, taking your own snacks on the plane um, and even just taking as much food overseas as possible that you normally would consume at home. Um, and also generally I'll book uh, an apartment that has cooking facilities especially around really big competitions and most competitions that I do compete in overseas uh, do, you know, require me to be jumping at my best against, you know, the best long jumpers in the world. So I want to make sure that I'm not eating out every day and, and risking, um, you know, mm. contamination because you just don't know how uh, well educated uh, other countries are and chef, chefs in other countries around celiac disease. So it's definitely not worth taking that risk. But yeah, I think just, you know, planning ahead and preparing for travel is super important. And I've been fortunate to have worked with a dietitian at the Victorian Institute of Sport, Kylie, who has been fantastic and has, you know, helped me manage overseas travel and just work around it as best as I can. So let's talk about your training now. We're in lockdown. I know you're a Victorian girl and you, the, the games are in Japan in July next year. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So tell us about what's happening during lockdown at your place as you're training to qualify for the Olympics in Japan. Like how do you yeah, do that? Yeah, it's been a very, <laughs> it's been a very different year, that's for sure. Um, so mm. this year I had the goal of of getting to the Tokyo Olympics, and unfortunately, you know those games have been pushed back a year. So it's meant that I've spent a lot of time at home, and having been in a lockdown back in March April period, and also currently now uh, we've been in stage four lockdown for the last. I think almost eight weeks now. Um, so unfortunately we've had a 5k radius uh, that we aren't allowed to, allowed to travel outside of. So that meant that I was unable to access an athletics track, which being a long jumper, uh, needing a sand pit is pretty essential. Mm -hmm. So I, I basically haven't jumped in a sand pit since, or I have now, sorry, but Prior to last week, I hadn't jumped in a sand pit since March, uh, which you know had been six months, which is quite a long time to oh. be away from doing what you do or you would do, you know, most days. So, um, also, you know, not being able to run on the track meant that I had to do a lot of my running at our local football oval. So that was pretty challenging, in a sense that. You know, so many people have been out and about lately, not being able to go to gyms and, um, you know, play local sport as well. So it's, it's been it's been hard, you know, having dogs on the footy oval as well and <laughs> just trying to manage all of that. Uh, and also the Victorian Institute of Sport, which is where I would do my weights, has been closed uh, for mm -hmm. the last eight weeks. So it's meant that I've had to do my weights at home in our garage which, you know, I've been very fortunate that my parents and my fiance Nathan's parents lent us some equipment. So I've been able to get done everything I've needed to. And I've just used it as a, you know, a period of time to be able to work on my weaknesses and try and give myself the best preparation uh, leading into next year's Tokyo Olympics. So do you feel that you have been disadvantaged because you're a Victorian girl and here you are, in lockdown and you've got your trials I understand next year like how are you dealing with the fact and the frustration that you can't even get to a running track and you're trying to duck the dogs and everyone else that's in your way as you're doing your training out on a football oval so do you feel disadvantaged 
I definitely feel like there would be a sense of disadvantage for sure. Um, but in saying mm. that, I've still been able to get done everything I need to do training wise. It's just been a matter matter of uh, making small little changes and modifications. Uh, you know, my running sessions that would normally be on the track, I'd just do them on the grass in runners rather than in spikes. So it, it hasn't been ideal, but I've still been able to work really hard during this period of time. So I feel like leading into next season, I am in quite good shape and I know that uh, I've done everything that I possibly could have, uh, you know, in this situation and in this unique scenario that we've been put in. Mm. So I, I'd, li I'd like to think that um, I'm in good stead for next year and I know that um, some other countries out there are a lot worse off than us but um, as I said sure. I've just been working really hard from home and uh, really looking forward to seeing what next year brings. You must have an amazingly positive mindset. Do you work on that? Is that really important particularly in the situation that you're in now? Yeah definitely. Um, I think you know, being an athlete, you need to be mentally tough. And for me, I've really learned to be able to see, you know, positives in negative situations and just take the positives away from a situation like this with COVID because you don't get anywhere if, if you're dwelling on things and you're focusing on all the negative things. Um, and my sports psychologist who I work with, um, said to me a couple of years ago when I was dealing with an injury to focus on the things that you can't do rather than sorry focus on the things that you can do rather than the things that you can't do and I've always had that in the back of my mind and it's allowed me to really focus on yeah what I can do especially in a situation like this because I know that well there is so many other people out there worse off and I'm still able to train and do what I love every day so just trying to see the positive light in this uh, quite dark time. And so with your celiac disease, do you see that as a disadvantage to being an athlete? Or do you see that, do you look at it quite differently through a positive view? So I definitely feel like I have a disadvantage being a celiac. Um, however, that's not to say that it's stopping me from or from from achieving my goals. Um, right. So, yeah, I think, you know, just making sure that I'm well prepared ahead of competitions, as I was saying earlier, and making sure that I'm doing all the right things with my diet to, you know, ensure that I'm eating well and, and well fueled. Um, it's definitely... Yeah, I think the, the message that I want to get across today is that if you're celiac or you have some sort of food intolerance or food allergy, don't let it stop you from achieving your goals. There's always ways around it. And I think for me, as I said, I could have given up during that really tough time experiencing the symptoms prior to my diagnosis, but I chose to not do that and I stuck with it even if I was you know feeling unwell and tired and fatigued uh, because I knew that you know that was my goal and I wanted to make that goal become a reality. We've got lots of questions coming through Brooke but before we go to that I understand you're working on something at the moment in regards to gluten-free which sounds terrific. Can you share your news on that? What, what are you planning? Um, so basically through this lockdown period, uh, because I haven't been able to train and compete, I had the idea of making gluten-free sweet boxes, uh, which are basically boxes filled with gluten-free lollies and chocolates. And to be honest, it's more of a side hobby to keep me busy while I'm spending a lot of time at home. Um, and although it doesn't align with my values of healthy eating and living a healthy lifestyle, it's been a nice way to, to, to brighten up the day of people that have celiac disease. Um, so yeah. the intentions were mainly directed at celiacs, you know, not having to miss out on these sort of things. Um, and also to just make them feel special as well. So, 
If you're interested in checking out what myself and also my fiance Nathan, who's helped me out with this little side hobby, um, you can check out our Instagram page, which is at GF Sweetbox. Fantastic. Everything in moderation. And it's great to treat yourself and be thinking of others that need a bit of cheering oh, up. Are you, happy to, are you happy to take some questions from our audience, Brooke? Sure. Okay. Um, where did they go? Here we are. Um, how do you keep yourself motivated? How do I keep myself motivated? I think setting goals oh. is a huge um, part of, you know, being able to stay focused and set yourself on a goal. So for me, you know, setting long-term and short-term goals is super important for me because I know that every day I'm waking up and the reason why I'm going out training is because I want to get here and I want to achieve this result or this outcome so I think yeah setting goals is super important and I think if you don't have goals it's really hard to yeah find that motivation to be able to go out and exercise every day so you mean you have daily goals and then longer term goals that are in relation to your achievements obviously with um, your long jump so is it daily goals as well Oh, I wouldn't quite say daily goals, but more so training goals. So I set myself targets um, throughout, you know, whether I have a testing period every four weeks or six weeks, just setting minor goals of, you know, just making sure that I'm moving in the right direction and I'm seeing some sort of progress. Uh, and then obviously you've got your long-term goals. And for me, that was the Tokyo Olympics and yep. moving past that in 2022 there's the commonwealth games and world championships so i think just making sure that you're looking ahead and you're striving for something definitely allows you to stay really motivated okay now there's lots of questions coming through about food in relation to your pre-competition and post-competition or pre-comp and post-comp um, and also about how you find, how do you find eating gluten-free when you're traveling for your sport? Have the teams been supportive in assisting you to stay healthy and gluten-free? Yeah, de they definitely have. Um, so there's generally a dietitian that will travel over with the Australian team, whether it's at an Olympic Games, a Commonwealth Games or a World Championships. And at the Commonwealth Games and Olympic Games, for example, we eat in the athletes' village. So this has a wide range of gluten-free options. Um, they also have a little gluten-free station that has gluten-free bread, a separate toaster, gluten-free snacks as well. So we're definitely very well looked after. And um, when traveling with the Australian team, they always cater for gluten-free as well and make sure that anyone with food allergies uh, have food available to eat uh, and food that they want to and need to eat as well that's suitable for their event. Okay, and also there's a question about are there any other athletes at your level that you know of that have food intolerances or allergies? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know one other high level track and field athlete that has celiac disease. Um, in terms of food intolerances, I know that there's a few athletes that I've traveled overseas with that are lactose intolerant. Um, right. Apart from that, I'm not really too sure if there are many athletes that I do know that have intolerances or allergies. Um, I do know Ben Brown, who is an AFL footballer oh, yes. uh, for North Melbourne. He is also a celiac. So he's another prime example of an athlete that's been able to follow their dreams. Um, he obviously had the dream of getting to the AFL level and he's been able to do that. Um, so, yeah. So is there, um, someone's asked here, 
where do you go for recipe inspiration? That's a great question. Um, so generally, my cooking isn't super fantastic. I must add that in. Um, but generally, I'll use the recipe recipe app, which is um, just an app that I've got on my iPhone that has a number of gluten free recipes um, and meal ideas. So that's something that I've been since I've moved out of home last year, I've definitely been using that app a lot because um, having had my mum cook dinner for me almost every night and <laughs> uh, my partner's mum as well it's it's definitely taught me a lot in the kitchen and I think yeah just trying to expand my uh, cooking skills as well <laughs> so I'm what still was that app again I missed <laughs> what was it's that called, app again I missed it it's called recipesy I think I'll double check. Okay. Oh, yeah. Recipe easy. GF. Okay. I'm sure our audience. Now, there's lots of questions still coming, Brooke, about when you're overseas at an athlete's, athletics meet, is it really difficult to manage your diet? I mean, lots of people are asking, how do you do it? How do you manage your diet? You can't take everything in your suitcase. You know, are your coaches and your dietitians planning ahead and making sure that the right food for you is available? Yeah, so I, I work closely <laughs> with my at the Victorian Institute of Sport who, um, you know, provides me with guidance on how to overcome challenging times if I'm put in a situation where there is no option for me. Um, so planning ahead definitely allows uh, a more smooth sailing, uh, well, smooth sailing travel. So um, what I generally will do though, is if I know that I'm staying in a hotel room, I'll book an apartment so I can have my own cooking facilities and I can keep my diet very similar to what it would be if I was at home or if I was in Australia. So having mm -hmm. access to things like the microwave allows me to be able to heat up, you know, rice if that's what I need or heat up veggies. Um, also have cutlery and, and plates and bowls and all that sort of stuff. So um, there's definitely ways around it. I do find it very challenging. And as I said, I just try and take as much food over with me um, as possible and also try and do a little bit of research as well around, you know, if I'm staying at a certain hotel, what options are there around me? Is there a supermarket where I can go and purchase food that I can cook in my hotel room? So just doing a little bit of research and being super organised as well. And so with your timeline, can you, for next year, for the Olympics, can you explain to us how that works? When you're doing your trials, what date would you find out if you've qualified for the Olympics? And have you got a few rivals here in Australia or you're really confident that you're definitely going to be there? How does it work? Because of your past history, Sorry. I mean, that of course. <laughs> Yep, so the qualifying period opens in December. So we basically have from December right through until June next year to qualify. Uh, for long jump, the qualifying distance is 6 metres 82, uh, my PB being wow. 7 metres and 5 centimetres. So I'd like to hope that hopefully somewhere you know, early next year I can get the qualifying standard out of the way because that will definitely take the pressure off um, and the longer you leave it, the more stressful the process becomes. So, um, and basically we have our Australian championships. Uh, there's not a date for that as of yet, but it'll, it, it's generally anywhere between March and April. So at the Australian championships, you're normally, um, if you come in the top three, uh, that's basically uh, selection on the team so they can take up to three athletes per country to a major championships and in long jump there'll be 32 athletes that are able to compete so yeah so hopefully wow. all being well in Australia we have some opportunities or even in Victoria 
um, you know, whether it's before Christmas or after Christmas to be able to get some competitions going um, with COVID. Yeah, we all hope for sure. So um, Bridie's asking, you mentioned you felt relief after diagnosis. Did you also find it really stressful and mentally challenging to overcome? And we know it was around the time yeah. that you were planning to go to the Olympics, but you know, I, I can understand that sense of relief at last, they finally found out what's going on. But then how did you mentally overcome that beyond your goal of going to the Olympics, that the restrictions then that were going to happen with your diet? Yeah, so um, although I did mention that, I was really relieved about my diagnosis. I was also really stressed because I knew that being an athlete, a lot of travel was going to be, um, you know, on, on my schedule for the next, you know, whether it was 10 years of my life. So it was something that I did. I didn't know anything about celiac disease as well. So I made sure I did as much research uh, as I could and the one thing that really, really, really helped as well was um, joining Celiac Victoria Tasmania, which is now, I think, just Celiac Australia. Um, so I actually went into their offices um, and the amount of help that I received from them was amazing. Um, I remember walking in and seeing a massive array of gluten-free products and I took a photo and I remember, you know, just thinking to myself, wow, I can still eat this. I can still eat that. Like this isn't all that bad. So it definitely shifted the way I saw the situation as well. Um, and I guess, you know, that relief that I was feeling as well was, it was mainly due to how much I'd struggled and I'd had these goals and those goals hadn't been achieved. And I knew that if I could get my body healthy again, I'd be able to, you know, focus on my next goal. And in 2013, when I was diagnosed, my next goal that I set was the 2014 Commonwealth Games. So wow. I, I straight away switched my focus to another goal. And that's definitely what helped get me through that really tough period of missing out on the London Olympics. Mm. I had something else to focus on and something else to look forward to. And I did end up qualifying for the Commonwealth Games, which wow. I think just goes to show that my performances were plateauing through the period of uh, diagnosis. But then once I was diagnosed and did completely change up my diet and my um, small intestine did repair and I did feel healthy again, I was able to be back jumping PBs. So in 2014, mm. I jumped my first PB uh, in two and a half years and that put me on the team for the Glasgow Commonwealth Games. So that was super exciting and it was just super unfortunate that I had the Commonwealth Games to look forward to and I'd had my health back on track um, and I was feeling super positive about everything to then find out a week before I was due to leave to Glasgow that I had a stress fracture in my back. So that oh, no. was, yeah, it was another period in my life so where, um, yeah, I was challenged and, you know, I think after having such a rough period pre-celiac diagnosis, it taught me to be stronger and it taught me to be able to overcome challenging times. And with this injury, I was, you know, I was unable to compete, um, you know, for I think it was like six or seven or even eight months. Um, I was wow. unable to train for three months. So I basically did nothing for three months, uh, which is completely unlike me, but it definitely made me a stronger person, everything I went through with celiac disease. And now I, I definitely am able to listen to my body a little bit better too. So um, what about the 2018 Commonwealth Games? Tell us about that when you got silver. Yeah, that was an amazing experience. Um, having been in Australia. Where was it again? On the Gold, on the it Gold was in Coast. April. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it was. Nice on the Gold Coast in April, 2018. Um, and yeah, of course. prior to that, 
Prior to that event, actually, I had a stress fracture in the sesamoid bone in my big toe. And I didn't actually know whether I would make it to these Commonwealth Games because of this quite serious injury. Um, I was in a moon boot for about six weeks and I didn't, yeah, I basically had a very minimal preparation leading into these games. Um, but having had my family and friends in the crowd, it was absolutely amazing. And having the crowd was majority Aussies that were cheering for all of us Australian athletes. So it was honestly like one of the best days of my life being able to win that silver medal and having all my close friends and family to be able to, you know, experience it with me. It was amazing. Fantastic. There's quite a few questions coming through about snacks. So Lisa's asking, just wondering during a meet at the track, what foods do you snack on? And then Margot's saying, well, what's your go-to snack when you're on the road? That's a great idea. Um, sorry, a great question. Um, generally snack wise, I'll stick to something as simple as a banana or a muesli bar. Um, I don't want to be consuming anything really heavy in my stomach around competition. So something that's going to be easy to digest. Um, my go-to snack though would be um, corn thins with peanut butter and banana. Okay, yum. <laughs> so <laughs> what would your message be? <laughs> what would your message be to a teenager who's just been diagnosed with celiac disease, what would your key message be to them at this point? Um, it definitely would be to not let it affect you. Uh, as hard as it is to accept it, you know, you've got to be able to accept it and move forward and make all the changes that you need to make. Um, I was 19 when I was diagnosed and Although it was really tough at the time, I knew that I just had to make the changes. And I think just increasing your knowledge on the disease and understanding it as well definitely helps uh, with the acceptance. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest message I want to get across is don't let something like celiac disease or any food intolerance or allergy stop you from achieving your goals and getting to where you want to get to with your life because there's definitely ways around it there's days that you're going to feel you know pretty average but as a whole you know you know what you need to do you know what foods that you can and you can't have um, so the best thing you can do is just follow all the guidelines and all the rules and if you need help with that reach out to a dietitian or reach out to mm -hmm. someone that's going to be able to help you that's a great message Brooke, thank you. Um, look, we've really almost run out of time, but tell us um, your Instagram account. So I know you've got two. One, we can follow your journey as an Olympian. And there's another directly related to celiac. Is that correct? Can you tell the audience about your accounts? Because I'd love to follow you on both of them. So what are they? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so my personal Instagram account is at Brooke Stratton um, and I've also recently yep. just started up uh, a celiac athlete account um, to, to basically just showcase the food that I eat. Um, I probably need to start posting a little bit more to be honest um, but yeah the foods that I eat and also yeah just basically a little bit about the lifestyle I live as well being an athlete and a celiac and that account is at the celiac athlete wait hang on I'm, is it <laughs> check that i'm just gonna, gonna check it i'm <laughs> gonna have to double check the celiac That's athlete okay. sorry <laughs> so wh where can we follow your journey on the road to the olympics in japan where was that on your personal Brooks yeah, I account? Think <laughs> my personal account will um, show a lot more about my life uh, in general. Um, and it, I also post videos of my training and yeah, everything pretty much goes on my personal account and then everything 
food related or celiac related goes on the celiac athlete. Fantastic. Look, thank you so much, Brooke, for your time today. You are a wonderful ambassador for celiac disease, for everything that you've achieved. And I know the audience and all of our team here will be following your journey really closely on your march to Japan to win a gold medal. That's what we're all hope that we know that you have got the ability and the strength to do it. So we'll all be supporting you in every way we can. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. You're already a champion. I mean, you've got such a fantastic attitude. You're such a great ambassador and the messages you, you offer today, particularly to our young people who might have recently been diagnosed with celiac disease. So thank you, Brooke, and we wish you great success. Thank you very much, that means so much. <laughs>